Dr. Daly. Thank you everyone for being here tonight. I recognize that you have a lot of choices for what you could do with a Tuesday evening, so I'm honored that you've made time to come and think with and about Pascal. Um, since I'm one of the newer members of the Urbana Seminary faculty, and this is my first time giving a taste of seminary talk in person, that was written in my paper already. That was not a slide. <laughs> I want to begin tonight by telling you a little bit about myself, much like we would do if it was our first night of class together. I've worked for Urbana Seminary for almost three years now. I actually have two job titles. I am Assistant Professor of Philosophy of Education and Religious Studies, the booming field with the acronym of PEARS. And I am also the Director of Pascal Study Center, or PSC. PSC is Urbana Seminary's outreach to the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. I'll tell you a little bit more about PSC at the end of tonight's talk. I live in Urbana with my husband, Mark, who works in cybersecurity for the U of I. We have a 13-month-old son named Forrest, who is currently home and hopefully will be getting ready for bed pretty soon. He is the delight of our lives. Becoming parents has been such an adventure and a gift, and yes, I brought it first. Hello. There we go. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll leave them up for a minute. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start my handout going around. This is mostly to help you follow along and give you space for notes if you desire. Academically, I have my PhD from the University of Illinois. My primary area of interest is in the conditions of Christian faithfulness in late modernity. I particularly focus on the challenges and possibilities of formation for faithfulness in the midst of deep pluralism. This interest led me to the study of the theory of secularism. Now, secular and secularism are words that Christians toss around a lot but we aren't always clear about what we mean by them. We talk about secular movies, books, and music, a secular school or a secular job, and even the secular world. We usually just assume that everyone knows what we mean, but each of these terms deserves quite a bit of unpacking. But that is not tonight's talk. Eventually, I came across the idea of post-secularism. Post, of course, meaning after, as in post-production, the editing and other work that are done after production. Post-apocalyptic, a story that takes place after the apocalypse. And post-mortem, an examination that happens after death. So post-secularism is whatever comes after secularism. I began to discover thinkers in a number of fields, Philosophy, religious studies, education, and literary, literary studies. Oh, it also scrolls. That's good to know. OK. Uh, a number of thinkers who were dissatisfied with the prevailing account of the role of religion in the modern world. So for much of the 20th century, observers had believed that public religion, at least, would gradually decline and fade away. Individuals might continue to hold religious beliefs or engage in private religious practices, but religion would no longer have a prominent place in society as a whole. This account is known as secularization theory. I think I'm starting to get the hang of this. The proponents of secularization theory described certain changes that they understood to be occurring. Religiosity was shifting from public to private, and numerical rates of religious belief and practice were also declining overall. But they not only described these changes, they also offered a causal explanation for them. As the key features of modernity spread around the globe, this is the argument, including scientific and technological progress, democracy, mass education, and capitalism, these features would effectively push religion out of the way. So more modernity, less religion. That's secularization theory. The continuing unfolding of history, as well as more accurate data, have undermined belief in secularization theory. We are now well into the 21st century, and religion continues to play a prominent role in public life, both here in this country and around the world. 
as one of my colleagues writes, in a general sense, the post-secular refers to the idea that modernity no longer entails an inevitable march towards secularism and the loss of faith. So you can have more modernity, not necessarily less religion. Yet, it is also undeniable that there has been a shift of some sort. For example, public universities no longer require their students and faculty to attend chapel services. Is this right? <laughs> and we no longer assume that our neighbors, coworkers, and classmates share the same religious identity or outlook. In fact, no matter how strong our own religious convictions, every one of us is deeply aware that there are other people out there with convictions that are equally strong, yet totally different. Sorry, I'm still just checking to make sure I'm in the right place. Uh, this awareness that there, there are much, just as strong but totally different convictions from our own, this awareness is what philosopher Charles Taylor refers to as the condition of being cross-pressured. You could think of being in a stream that's pushing you in different ways. Post-secularism thus entails the rejection of simplistic versions of the secularization theory that dominated the 20th century, yet without returning to the dominance of any single religion. So where does that leave us? While it can be difficult to pin down, the core idea of post-secularism is radical pluralism. In a post-secular age, no one view is dominant, whether secular or religious. It's a little bit like October in Illinois, where it's winter, spring, summer, and fall all at the same time. In this talk, we're going to explore three dimensions of post-secularism. The epistemological, the experiential, and the existential. Don't worry, I'll explain each of these as we go. Let's start with the epistemological dimension. Right. Well, that's fine. I told myself where to click, so I should just be obeying myself and not second guessing it. <laughs> Epistemology has to do with how we know what is true. For example, do you listen to a religious or civil leader, scientific consensus, parents or peers, or your own experiences? The epistemological dimension of a post-secular age means that there is no single authority for truth. We cannot expect everyone to accept as truth the claims made by the president, the pope, the head of the CDC, or any other authority figure. Don't worry, that's about as political as I'm going to get tonight. Instead, each person decides for themselves who they will listen to and what they will accept as truth. We could give lots of different examples of this, such as the polarization of the media or controversies around fake news, not to mention the complexities introduced by artificial intelligence. In fact, journalist Bonnie Christian has written a whole book about the epistemological crisis facing our society. For present purposes, though, I'm going to focus on just one example, conflicting views of science. About a year ago, Pew Research Center conducted a survey on Americans' views of science and scientists. They found that a majority of Americans, 57%, believe science has had a mostly positive effect on society. However, this is down 16 percentage points for its pre-pandemic high of 73%. Similarly, a large number of Americans, 73%, expressed trust in scientists in 2023, and that number is also down 14 percentage points since before the pandemic. It's worth noting here that trust is down in general, and scientists are actually higher than other groups, including business leaders, religious leaders, journalists, and elected officials. Perhaps unsurprisingly, while trust in science has decreased among both Republicans and Democrats, it is also true that it is sharply polarized, with 38% of Republicans saying they have little or no trust in scientists, compared to just 13% of Democrats. At the same time, nearly four in five Americans, 78%, say government investments in scientific research are usually worthwhile for society, and 89% say it is very or somewhat important for the US to be a world leader in scientific achievements. So, do Americans believe in science? Survey says, yes and no. <laughs> Americans are conflicted in their view of science and scientific authority, both in their own minds and across society. 
some people just, if you just look at the, the math of it, it just kind of has to be the case. Some people see the value of scientific achievements while remaining unsure whether to trust scientists. There just mathematically have to be some people that are in both categories. And some groups trust scientists considerably less than others do. In a post-secular society, there is no single source of truth, whether scientific or otherwise. And yes, the sharp disagreements over public policy during the pandemic are absolutely part of this story. But the fact that the pandemic divided our society so starkly along partisan lines just serves to demonstrate how far we are from any real consensus about the sources of truth. Next, the experiential dimension. By this, I mean the way that post-secularism is experienced as we go about our lives, as we live, work, study, vote, shop, play, and otherwise inhabit the world. One of the things we encounter is that in a post-secular age, there is no single way of practicing religion. Even if you yourself have a religious practice that you are fully committed to, you are bound to interact with other people who practice the same religion differently from you, who practice a different religion, or who are not religious at all. A post-secular world looks like a patchwork quilt of religious, spiritual, and secular options that can be mixed, matched, and customized to suit the preferences of each individual. Charles Taylor refers to this as the Nova effect, where ways of engaging with spirituality multiply almost beyond comprehension. Similarly, journalist Tara Isabella Burton vividly describes what she calls remixed religion. She writes that more and more Americans envision themselves as creators of their own bespoke religions, mixing and matching spiritual and aesthetic and experiential and philosophical traditions. Today's remixed reject authority, institution, creed, and moral universalism. They value intuition, personal feelings, and experiences. They demand to rewrite their own script about how the universe and human beings operate. Shaped by the twin forces of a creative, communicative internet and consumer capitalism, I could do a whole lecture just unpacking those two things, Today's remixed don't want to receive doctrine to assent automatically to a creed. They want to choose and more often than not purchase the spiritual path that feels more authentic, more meaningful to them. In this context, as Burton describes, the only standard that remains is authenticity. Whatever I decide feels right for me, that is the kind of spirituality I should follow. Here's an example very close to home. At UIUC, the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion publishes a list every year of more than 60 religious observances that affect the academic calendar. The groups represented include Protestant, Catholic, and Eastern Orthodox Christians, as well as Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, Jains, Buddhists, Baha'is, and Wiccans. The list also includes two holidays designated as interfaith, Kwanzaa and the Lunar New Year. Finally, after a whole calendar of these observances, the web page notes, members of the University of Illinois community practice a diversity of religious, spiritual, and secular traditions, and individuals may celebrate observances not listed below. <laughs> Covering their bases. Without a unifying religious authority, the university leaves it up to each individual student to determine whether and how they will engage with religion or spirituality. Before we move on from the experiential dimension, it is worth noting that post-secularism does not necessarily mean hostility to religion. In fact, a post-secular age can be much more open to religion and spirituality than the more militant secularism that characterized much of the 20th century. The Barna Group characterizes Gen Z as the open generation. That's the term that they've settled on to describe Gen Z. According to their research, three-fourths of US teens are interested in continuing to learn about Jesus throughout their lives, and over half are very motivated to do so. Similarly, three-fourths of US adults would like to grow spiritually, and nearly half are more open to God than before the pandemic. 
More anecdotally, people who minister to college students, including at the U of I, are reporting unprecedented levels of engagement and enthusiasm in the last couple of years. I keep hearing the term revival tossed around. Not quite sure how you put data to that, but that's, that's the language that I'm hearing used on campus. It can be unsettling to regularly interact with so many different forms of religion and spirituality, but it does not mean that we can no longer live as faithful Christians or share the gospel freely. In fact, quite the opposite. The third dimension of post-secularism that we'll consider today is the existential dimension. While the epistemological dimension has to do with what we know and believe, and the experiential dimension has to do with what our beliefs look like in practice, the existential dimension reaches all the way inside us to where we find meaning and purpose. In a post-secular age, not only do we have no single authority for truth, not only do we have no single way of practicing religion, but we have no single source of purpose. I'm going to give you two examples of this dimension, one mundane, one much more serious. First, if you reach into your pocket or your bag, you will most likely find a device that can provide you with an effectively unlimited stream of stimulation, diversion, and distraction. <laughs> Four in 10 US adults and six in 10 of those ages 18 to 29, I'm looking at certain people in this corner, <laughs> say they're online almost constantly. As an aside, 5% of those surveyed say they don't use the internet at all, and I'm just so curious about who these people are and what their lives are like. But we'll set that aside. Of course, the internet and smartphones have brought a lot of good, especially in the ways they make possible connections and communication that would be unimaginable without them. For example, social media are used to spread emergency information and coordinate disaster relief efforts. But these benefits are embedded in an undifferentiated stream that ranges indiscriminately from the useful and interesting to the trivial and forgettable to the downright harmful. What's more, the stronger the pull of digital stimulation, the harder it becomes to disconnect from the online world in order to connect with the people right in front of us. According to a Pew Research study, listen to this carefully, according to a Pew Research study, nearly half of teens say their parent is at least sometimes distracted by their phone when they're trying to talk to them. But when parents are asked to assess their own behavior, fewer, 31% say this happens regularly. And they say smartphones are a young people problem. This is something I'm paying more attention to now that I have a kid of my own. It's just so easy to pull out my phone instead of interacting with him. And which of us has not had this experience? You have every intention of reading a book, having a meaningful conversation, or just going to bed early, but find yourself instead sucked down the rabbit hole of endless scrolling. Can I get an amen? <laughs> so my first example is so widespread as to be almost invisible. As for my second example, I hope that it is not nearly so relatable for those in this room. But in one way or another, it touches the lives of more and more individuals, families, and communities. In 2022, an average of 224 people per day were killed by opioid overdose. At the peak of opioid prescribing in 2012, there were 81 prescriptions for every 100 people in America. Since the end of the 20th century, opioid deaths have increased tenfold. These deaths are just one component of what are being called deaths of despair, a category that includes drug and alcohol overdoses as well as suicides. These deaths have risen significantly among work working age adults without college degrees, especially white males. The causes of the opioid epidemic and the deaths of despair crisis are multiple and complex, and I do not want to diminish the important and difficult work that is being done to understand and address these tragedies. It's very, little, very easy for what I'm about to say to just completely trivialize this tragedy. It's not my goal. 
But one thing they tell me is that we, as a society, do not know how to deal with pain, either physical or psychological pain. Of itself, pain is not a cause for despair. In fact, certain kinds of pain produce hope and joy rather than despair. Consider the pain of an athlete in training or a woman during childbirth. But these pains have a clear purpose, to make a body stronger, to bring a baby into the world. However, what can drive us to despair is pain without purpose. Some cope with pain, boredom, and purposelessness through opioids and other drugs, while others pursue distraction and diversion online. Both drugs and digital diversions are more readily available today than in earlier ages, just when we lack a clear sense of purpose, which would help us resist these temptations. So I understand both boredom and pain as problems of purpose. At this point, you're probably wondering when we're going to talk about Blaise Pascal. <laughs> Don't worry, we're almost there. But first, let's summarize what we've talked about so far. We've said that a post-secular age is one in which no single view dominates, and therefore one with no single authority for truth, no single way of practicing religion, and no single source of purpose. It is into this age that, I believe, Pascal speaks. This 17th century Frenchman directly addresses the conditions of post-secularism faced by Americans in the 21st century. Was Pascal a time traveler? Question for another day. <laughs> Before we consider how Pascal responds to the three dimensions of post-secularism that we have just been discussing, here's a brief overview of Pascal's life. Blaise Pascal was born in France on June 19, 1623. He was the middle child between two sisters. His family belonged to the emerging class of government officials and intellectuals, a class in the words of one biographer as distinct from the ancient nobility as from the common people. During his youth, Pascal showed a marked aptitude for scientific and mathematical achievement. He spent his early years in the company of French intellectuals and social elites and so developed a deep understanding of both the allure of worldly success and its disappointment. Over time, though, both he and his sisters grew more serious about their Christian piety. On the evening of November 23rd, 1654, Pascal had a profound mystical experience. Following this experience, he devoted himself more fully to God and to the Catholic Church. Pascal hoped to write a great work of apologetics which would defend Christianity from its opponents and provide compelling reasons for faith. However, the book remained incomplete at the time of his death on August 19, 1662. His notes and fragments for this apologetic work were collected, organized, and published as the famous pensées that we have today. Uh, this should not feel remotely adequate. Um, this should actually leave you wanting to know more about Pascal. And we will learn more about Pascal's life and work as we go along. This is just to give you a, a framework and a starting place um, so that you have some idea who I'm talking about as I, as I move forward. Let's turn now to consider how Pascal helps us know how to live in a post-secular age. We will see first that Pascal responds to the epistemological dimension of post-secularism by affirming both the worth and limits of human reason he responds to the experiential dimension by illuminating the uniqueness of Christianity, and he responds to the existential dimension by demonstrating the right response to pain. So first, the worth and limits of human reason. Pascal was born over 400 years ago, but his historical moment was strikingly similar to ours. He too faced competing sources of truth. He lived in the second century after the Protestant Reformation split Western Christianity into many shards, each with a competing claim to truth, not only about God, salvation, and right and wrong, but everything from political authority to economic systems to educational theory. In particular, in Pascal's day, like our own, there were competing views of the nature of science and its value. Pascal was part of an important development in the history of science. 
He contributed to the transition from purely theoretical reasoning based on first principles about the way the natural world ought to be to empirical experimentation that used observation to test and verify scientific claims. As a young man, Pascal conducted a series of experiments that helped to demonstrate the existence of the vacuum. Pascal didn't invent either the hypothesis of a vacuum or the experiments to prove its existence. His innovation was to actually carry out those experiments. In this way, he directly contributed to the development of the scientific method by helping to establish the value of empirical observation for progress in scientific knowledge. Pascal could never have foreseen the vital applications of the vacuum that he helped to discover, but he did have a keen sense for the practical use of science. When he was a teenager, his father was appointed tax collector in Rouen. Now, this post was particularly challenging because of recent rebellions and the measures that had been taken to repress them. And the calculations required to carry out the job were especially arduous. In order to help his father, Pascal produced the first working automatic arithmetical machine. <laughs> now, don't think like pocket calculator, think like this big, but it worked. Like the vacuum experiments, what was original to Pascal was not so much the general idea as its effective execution. Pascal knew how to take theoretical concepts and turn them into something that actually worked in the world. Perhaps even more importantly, he cared enough to do so. The care that motivated Pascal's scientific efforts can be seen most clearly in an endeavor he pursued during the final years of his life. With several other friends, Pascal helped to establish a regular carriage service in Paris, a precursor of the Omnibus Company. If you took a bus to get here tonight, thank Pascal. <laughs> Pascal planned to use his profits from this venture to help the poor. So far, Pascal appears to agree <coughs> with those who believe science's effect on society is mostly positive, and those who affirm that investments in scientific research are worthwhile. Look at everything science has given us, syringes, calculators, public transport. Yet there is more to say here. Pascal recognized the limits of scientific knowledge just as much as its value. Echoing St. Augustine, he wrote, knowledge of physical science will not console me for ignorance of morality in time of affliction, but knowledge of morality will always console me for ignorance of physical science. I'm gonna read that again. Thank you. Knowledge of physical science will not console me for ignorance of morality in time of affliction, but knowledge of morality will always console me for ignorance of physical science. Tell that to your professor next time you have a math uh, midterm to turn in. <laughs> we will return to the matter of consolation in time of affliction below when we consider the right response to pain. Pascal might not go so far as those who express little or no trust in science, but those who do express this mistrust have a legitimate reason for concern. It is possible to elevate scientific expertise and human reason to the place of God. To both those who want to reject reason and those who want to worship it, Pascal advocates a balanced approach. Mankind suffers from two excesses, he wrote, to exclude reason and to live by nothing but reason. As one commentator summarizes Pascal's view, reason must be humbled, not humiliated. So what is Pascal's response to the epistemological dimension of post-secularism? He affirms that neither scientific expertise nor any other form of human reason can be the ultimate authority for truth. Yet his own life demonstrates the genuine, though limited, value of scientific endeavors. The limitations of science ought to lead us not to reject science altogether, but to search for something that can fulfill what science lacks. This brings us from the epistemological dimension, no single authority for truth, to the experiential dimension, no single way of practicing religion. Oh look, I had it up there. Here we go.
religious diversity in Pascal's world looked very different from religious diversity today. For example, 17th century French society had little familiarity with most of the religious observances recognized by the University of Illinois. <laughs> Pascal did write about Judaism and much more briefly about Islam, but in a way that suggests little direct experience with practicing Jews or Muslims. We can presume that Hinduism and Sikhism were quite unknown to Pascal, much less Wicca and the Baha'i faith, which would not even come into existence for another two to three centuries. Nevertheless, Pascal did encounter real differences of religion. Just a century earlier, the Reformation and Counter-Reformation had divided Christian Europe into Protestant and Catholic camps. During his lifetime, Pascal's own Catholic religion was rocked by the Jesuit Jansenist controversy. Pascal wrote a series of public letters arguing in favor of the Jansenist side. These conflicts between fellow Christians and even fellow Catholics might seem inconsequential to us today, but for Pascal and his contemporaries, they were just as much a matter of life and death as the religious conflicts that we face today. Pascal was also well acquainted with skepticism and so stoicism, philosophical schools of thought that were popular among French intellectual elites of his day. And he directly experienced ways of life that competed with Christian piety, the life of accomplishment, whether literary or scientific, and the life of card games, hunting, and other genteel amusements. It is toward these competing philosophies and ways of life that Pascal addressed his apologetic for Christian faith. One of Pascal's key ideas is the self-contradictory <coughs> nature of humanity. He writes, I don't think I have this quote up here. It's a long one. Hang with me. He writes, what kind of freak is man? What a novelty he is, how absurd he is, how chaotic, and what a mass of contradictions, and yet what a prodigy. He is judge of all things, yet a feeble worm. He is a repository of truth, and yet sinks into such doubt and error. He is the glory and the scum of the universe. Who will unravel such a tangle? It is certainly beyond the powers of dogmatism and skepticism to do so, indeed beyond all human philosophy, for man transcends man. Pascal asserts that human nature is both great and miserable simultaneously. Each one of us is capable of reaching both incredible heights of intellect and morality and incredible depths of stupidity and depravity. Consider, for example, the conflicting views of science that we have just discussed. Are scientific efforts the key to human progress or the force of much destruction? Are scientists bringers of light and truth or deceivers and scoundrels? The conflict regarding science persists in part because both accounts have a measure of truth. Consider, too, the ways that our collective quest for justice and peace seems never-ending. We always have just enough good in us to make us dream of making our world better and just enough bad to keep us from ever achieving that dream. Neither a narrative of triumph nor a narrative of despair can fully capture the complexities of human nature. Yet, narratives of triumph and narratives of despair surround us. Pascal points out that most philosophical systems only give half the picture. They can account for either humanity's highest aspirations or its lowest deprivations, but not both. He writes, consider greatness and misery. Since misery can be deduced from greatness and greatness from misery, some have emphasized misery because they have taken it as evidence of greatness. But since others have emphasized misery all the more strongly because they have deduced it from greatness, all that has been said to demonstrate greatness has only served to influence some people to accept misery, for we are all the more wretched because we have fallen from a high state. In brief, man knows he is wretched, therefore he is wretched because he is so, but he is also great because he is conscious of it. This complex, self-contradictory quality of human nature means that authenticity can provide no stable source of truth or meaning. What feels most authentic varies from moment to moment based on how you're feeling about yourself. So looking to yourself for a spiritual path provides no real answers. On the other hand, 
One religion alone uniquely understands humanity's divided nature, Christianity. In Pascal's words, for a religion to be true, our nature must be known. It must recognize its greatness and smallness and the reason for both. What other religion but the Christian faith has known this? Only the Christian doctrine of original sin can explain why humanity is, in Pascal's striking phrase, a dispossessed king. We are great because we once possessed paradise. We are miserable because we have now lost it. I think this is where I plug the talk in two weeks on Paradise Lost. <laughs> it is important to note that Pascal is not making a systematic survey of world religions, past or present. Rather, he is calling our attention to the way Christianity reveals a truth of our lived experience that we instinctively do not want to admit. His point is not merely abstract, philosophical, or comparative. It impacts each one of us directly and personally. Pascal's apologetic method is to force me to face the contradiction within myself. He writes, and this is my favorite Pascal quote of all time, if he exalts himself, I humble him. If he humbles himself, I exalt him. And so I go on contradicting him until he understands that he is a monster that passes all understanding. Like Riley, the adolescent protagonist in Inside Out 2, our best and worst impulses coexist side by side. We cannot ignore the times we have messed up and hurt others in big and small ways, but neither can we let those missteps overturn our longing to do better. In Pascal's own life, the uniqueness of Christianity was made real through his personal encounter with the living God. On the night of November 23rd, 1654, when he was 31 years old, Pascal experienced God in a unique and personal way that led to a renewed and deepened devotion. When he died eight years later, a piece of parchment was found sewn inside his jacket. Written on the parchment was Pascal's testimony to this experience. This is known as Pascal's Memorial. The memorial recounts Pascal's encounter with, in his words, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, not of philosophers and scholars. For each one of us, too, philosophical reflection is not enough. We must discover the uniqueness of Christianity through personal encounter with the one true living God. This leads us to the third dimension of post-secularism, the existential dimension. That is how post-secularism affects our deepest sense of purpose. Just as a post-secular age has no single authority for truth and no single way of practicing religion, so too it has no single source of purpose. And what could be a more fitting symbol of purposelessness than the smartphone, which throws together emergency alerts and merge three games, pictures of grandkids and pictures of random cats, scripture verses and political hot takes into one in undifferentiated mass of stimuli as flat as the screen on which we scroll. <laughs> Although he never handled a touch screen, Pascal's insights on boredom and diversion remain unsurpassed today. For example, one of his most famous sayings is, I have often felt that the sole cause of man's unhappiness is that he does not know how to stay quietly in his own room. <laughs> we laugh because we know it's true. <laughs> Pascal sees diversion as the way we cope ineffectively with our own misery and meaninglessness. He writes, take away their diversion and you will find them bored to extremity. Then they sense their emptiness without recognizing it rationally. For nothing can be more miserable than to be intolerably depressed as soon as one is reduced to introspection with no means of distraction. Again, think about that next time you're not sure where your phone is. Nothing can be more miserable than to be intolerably depressed as soon as one is reduced to introspection with no means of distraction. 
But those very distractions serve to exacerbate our misery by keeping us from reckoning with our actual state. Distraction is the only thing that consoles us for our miseries, yet it is itself the greatest of our miseries. For above all, it is that which keeps us from thinking about ourselves and so leads us imperceptibly to destruction. But for that, we should be bored, and boredom would drive us to seek some more reliable means of escape. But distraction passes our time and brings us imperceptibly to our death. Wow. Last week, we heard the story of Sir David Suchet, who came to Christ. Did, did I say that right? Sir David Suchet, who came to Christ in 1986 through reading the Bible in the dresser drawer of his hotel room. Imagine all the other ways he could have passed the time, even without a smartphone. <laughs> Distraction is whatever keeps us from becoming bored enough to recognize our need for a savior. In Pascal's view, we think we want to be set free from the many things that distract us and occupy our attention. But if we were actually offered the opportunity, we would not take it. He writes, they genuinely think they want rest when all they really want is busyness. They seek for rest by way of activity. We seek repose by battling against certain obstacles. And once they are overcome, we find rest is unbearable because of the boredom it generates. I see this, especially among university students. They can become so used to having something they need to do that they do not know how to rest. And if I'm honest, this is true in my own life too. Now remember, Pascal wrote this nearly 400 years before the invention of the smartphone. I keep saying this. The problem is not our technology, but our nature. We invent ways to avoid thinking about our own mortality, and then we forget that we have invented them. So we add misery to misery until we do not know where to turn for healing. When we discussed the purposelessness that characterizes post-secularism, I identified two symptoms. Not only our addiction to digital devices, but our addiction to painkillers, as well as other substances that numb or distract. Pascal speaks to both of these, though his writings on pain are much less well known than his writings on boredom. In his own life, Pascal was no stranger either to worldly diversions or to physical pain. He spent much of his youth in the fashionable society of Paris, pursuing worldly fame through scientific and mathematical achievements. Yet his life was also marked by quite poor health. According to his sister, he was in pain every day since the age of 18. His intellectual and theological works were frequently interrupted by illness. The last six months of his life were especially difficult physically, and he died young at only 39. In the words of one biographer, Pascal's life and work were, in fact, the fruit of a constant, victorious struggle against his illness. Pascal's genius is not to be explained by his illness. On the contrary, it was able to expand and achieve itself in spite of his illness. Toward the end of his life, Pascal wrote what became known as his prayer asking God for the right use of sickness. Now, most people who know anything about Pascal know him for his apologetic writings, his scientific and mathematical work, or both. Pascal's triangle, a key component of probability theory, and Pascal's wager, his most famous apologetic argument, both have their own page on Wikipedia. Pascal's prayer, however, is much less known. And this is a shame, because the prayer is both startling and moving. This is where we start to get really quote heavy. Hang with me. Most of us, when we face acute or chronic ill health, pray for relief and healing. If we are feeling particularly holy, we might also pray for patience to endure physical suffering or for opportunities to share the gospel on account of our illness. Pascal's prayer goes so much further. He asks to be sanctified and purified through his sickness in order that he might better serve and enjoy the Lord. 
He asks for his sickness to give him a pure heart to love the Lord only. Nope. Don't read that yet. Whether it be by weakness of body or by zeal for your love, render me incapable of enjoying the worldly idols that my delight may be only in you. Echoing his other writings about boredom and diversion, he asks for his sickness itself to bring healing to his sick soul. So let my sickness be the remedy itself by making me consider from the pains I feel those which I am morally insensitive to feel, for my soul is diseased and insensitive. Pascal finds in his illness rich resources for drawing closer to God. His physical pain negates any pleasure or comfort he might have been able to find in the world, leaving him hungry for God alone. Yet more than that, his sufferings give him a unique opportunity to identify with Christ Jesus, the suffering servant. Allow me to read to you at length from the prayer. I am nothing, O Lord, but my sufferings alone, which have some resemblance to yours. Look down, therefore, on the evils I struggle with, which threaten me. Look with the eye of mercy on the wounds your hand has made. O God, who became incarnate after the fall of man and did, not, and did take on a body to suffer all the penalty of sin for us with that body, you, O oh God, who has suffered for us in that body, accept my body, not for its own sake, nor for all that it contains, for all deserves your wrath, but on account of the sufferings it endures, which alone can be worthy of your love. May my sufferings invite you to visit me. Pascal goes on to implore the Lord, Oh, may I never feel pain without comfort, but may I feel pain and consolation together that I may afterwards attain to feel only the comforts without any mixture of pain. Finally, Pascal surrenders himself wholly to God. He prays, let me no longer wish for health or life, but to spend it and end it for you, with you, and in you. I pray neither for health nor sickness, life nor death. Rather, I pray that you will dispose of my health, my sickness, my life, and my death, as for your glory, for my salvation, and for, for the usefulness to your church and your saints, among whom I hope to be numbered. As one commentator explains, this prayer expresses in passionate but lucid periods a great effort to find a Christian meaning in his own suffering, to discern the divine will, and to submit to it wholly and trustfully. Pascal finds a purpose for his pain, God's glory and his sanctification. This purpose is utterly startling to us today, even to those of us who are Christians, yet it is available to every one of us. We know that God works through physical, mental, and spiritual suffering in many ways, but it is not always granted to us to see what he is doing. And sometimes God's purposes only become clear long after an individual's life is over. In Pascal's case, we can trust that God answered his heartfelt prayer for purification, sanctification, and fuller communion with the Lord through his suffering. Yet we can also guess at a further purpose for his pain, one that Pascal himself could not possibly have known. For most of his works, Pascal did not take notes during the writing process. Instead, he kept everything in his head and only wrote it down once he had already worked out what he wanted to say. Did I mention he was a genius? <laughs> but not the pensées. Pascal intended to write a great defense of the Christian faith, his magnum opus, but he died before he came close to completing the work he envisioned. The pensées are the notes and fragments of this work that he did complete in the final years before his death, and it seems that he was driven to write these notes down only by his increasingly poor health. One commentator writes, 
Conceivably, if he had not been ill, Pascal would have written nothing until the whole work was complete. So the pensées we have are bits and pieces recorded in the teeth of enervating sickness and impending death. <laughs> when I first realized that Pascal's pensées, the pensées which have contributed so much to my own faith in this post-secular age, may have only come down to us because of his sickness, I was strangely warmed and comforted in my own journey with chronic physical pain. To summarize, Blaise Pascal's life and work speak directly into the conditions of our post-secular age 400 years later. In response to the epistemological dimension of post-secularism, Pascal affirmed the very real value of scientific efforts, both for discovering truth and for doing good in the world. At the same time, he also insisted that human reason is limited and not sufficient, especially for discovering the right way to live. In response to the experiential dimension of post-secularism, Pascal painted a picture of human nature as divided and self-contradictory. Human beings are both glorious in our misery and miserable in our glory. Only a philosophical system that can account for this dual nature is worth following. And only Christianity, with its doctrine of original sin, can account for the simultaneous glory and wretchedness of humanity. And lastly, in response to the existential dimension of post-secularism, Pascal, Pascal pointed out that the diversions we pursue to alleviate our boredom only make us more wretched. On the other hand, physical suffering can draw us into sweeter communion with God. I want to leave you with a few ways that you can continue engaging with the ideas I've presented here. First of all, I encourage you to read Pascal for yourself. You do not need a fancy commentary to begin exploring the pensées. Much like the Bible, Pascal's writing is clear enough for a beginner, yet worth pondering for a lifetime. Pascal's memorial and his prayer are also deserving of careful reading and meditation. It's not something you can say for all philosophers. You can find the full text of both of these by searching online. Second, on your handout, on the back if you haven't already flipped over, you have some prompts for reflection. These questions are inspired by Pascal's life and thought and invite you to consider your own way of life in a post-secular age. Who or what do you trust? Where do you look for truth? How do you relate to people who consider truth what you consider falsehood and vice versa? Do you tend to focus on humanity's greatness or its misery? How does this make parts of our life and our world easier or harder to explain? When you face physical or psychological pain, how do you respond? Take these questions with you as you leave here tonight and continue reflecting on them in the coming days. So my intent is not to like break up in small groups. I'm not going to do any of that. But I did, I did leave you space on your paper if you want to journal or reflect or anything like that. Finally, I want to invite you to learn more about Pascal Study Center, Urbana Seminary's outreach to the University of Illinois. This ministry is named after Blaise Pascal because I believe he speaks so clearly to the age we live in today. In its various facets, the university both reveres and rejects science. It both honors and is puzzled by religious faith. And it fosters both endless busyness and endless diversion. The contradictions embodied by the university are exactly the contradictions that Pascal identified within the human heart. Through guest talks, book studies, dinner discussions, and more, Pascal Study Center is creating opportunities for the university community to wrestle with these contradictions and hopefully to encounter the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Pascal, a God who is still living and active today. Thank you again for coming tonight, and I welcome your questions. Major 
wanted to do that about five minutes into the talk. <laughs> he had some mentors, uh, some humans rather than some books, um, particularly within the Jansenist movement um, within 17th century French Catholicism, um, who I think deeply shaped him in his thought and his spirituality and also in his own uh, life, um, both a spiritual director and other, um, other pious people who were a little bit ahead of him and walking alongside him. And you will only ever hear their names if you are researching the life of Pascal or the Jansenist movement. What? Jansenist? I don't have a whiteboard, do I? Uh, he was a Catholic thinker, uh, a Catholic teacher, um, a couple of generations before Pascal. And um, he essentially taught Augustinian Christianity. He taught a, a strong reliance on grace, um, a deep view of human sinfulness, uh, and a bunch of other really complicated things. Um, but um, the Jansenists got into a huge controversy with the Jesuits, you probably have heard of. And the Jesuits were teaching that um, humans were not really that sinful, um, that you could um, kind of arg argue your way out of seeing any particular action that you had taken as not actually all that bad. They were, um, they were engaging in some uh, fancy argumentation to um, say, well, well maybe, maybe your intent wasn't actually that bad, or maybe um, there's a plausible reason that you could have had to do the sinful thing that you did, or all sorts of ways to kind of worm out of that. Um, and so the, the Jansenists and the Jesuits were intellectually and, and theologically at each other, like people continue to be for one reason or another today. Uh, and Pascal pretty firmly sided with the Jansenists. They're sometimes called Catholic Calvinists. They would actually hate that term. Um, <laughs> but just to show you, just to give you a hint at how complicated it all is and, and uh, would need to be a whole other lecture. Are they, are they in response to the Reformation? Yeah, yeah. So all of this, you know, again, if I'm drawing like a timeline of church history, all of this is within the Catholic Church in France about 150 years after, 125 years after Martin Luther. Um, so everybody, Catholic and Protestant, is trying to work out grace and free will and human responsibility and how are we going to cut all of these lines and... Um, the Protestants had their own way of hammering that out and drawing their lines, and this is one of the Catholic ones. Maybe Will can add more to that, my resident Catholic um, expert. Yeah, as the token Catholic here, I'm a bit rusty on my French Catholicism. <laughs> uh, the, the Jansenists, uh, they certainly caused quite a stir in yeah. the Catholic Church at the time, uh, because the Catholic Church was coming off the Council of Trent not that long ago, which really hammered out a lot of the lines um, that the Catholic Church was kind of grappling with in the wake of the Reformation. And then the Jansenists came in and they kind of tried to blur some of those lines a little bit. So it was, uh, it was a really big deal. Yeah. If anybody really, really wants to get into that with me, uh, you have my email address on your handout. Give me like a week to brush up on my Pascal sources and then let's debate and let's talk. <laughs> That's curious. What was... Does, did he detail at all what was this radical experience with God that he had? What, what, what happened? And what was his suffering that he thought was of so much value? Two excellent questions. Um, so uh, the, the mystical encounter, um, as far as I know, I don't think he ever talked to 
another soul about it. He probably talked to the spiritual director about it. But, like, the memorial is not written to be published. Like, there's no autobiography or memoir of Pascal, nothing like that. What we have is the text that was found sewn into his, um, sewn into his coat. And so we have to kind of infer um, what happened from that but it's it's dated quite clearly it says from like i think it's 10 30 at night to 12 30 at night so it's like <laughs> he was apparently pretty lucid either immediately during or immediately after to be able to to note um and it's about two pages of printed english text now again you can find it very easily online um but it's like all of these things, how, how are you going to put this into words? So uh, it's amazing to me how well he is able to put it into words. Um, and it, it, it kind of goes through his, his wrestling and some of the verses that were on his mind and his, his eventual uh, surrender to the God that I think, I think it's hard to account for that by anything other than God coming and meeting with him and um, saying, you're mine now. Um, in terms of the suffering that he experienced, there's kind of two pieces to this. Again, he suffered from uh, incredible poor health, and, and you know, this is before most of modern science, um, but it, it was noteworthy to the people of his day how poor his health was, the, the battles of sickness that he faced. Again, he died quite young, and... Um, I don't want to get too gory, but it is Halloween week. They, they actually performed an autopsy on him, and it sounds like his body was just um, eaten alive almost. Um, so physical suffering, um, certainly. And then it seems clear that he was really kind of spiritually tormented throughout his life. Um, never quite felt like he was on a firm footing. Uh, I think wrestled with kind of personal existential, I don't want to say doubts to the extent of like, oh, I might actually be an atheist, but um, kind of doubting, doubting the, the purity of his motives, doubting the extent of his own faith, uh, and kind of having to come back. Uh, there's actually three different points in Pascal's life that are referred to as a conversion. And for none of those does that mean I was a complete atheist or hedonist or what have you, and now I'm saved, but he just kind of keeps having to restart and having to go deeper, and um, I think I think was um, spiritually quite troubled as well. <coughs> yes? Having What's your name, by the way? Carol. Carol. I'm so glad you could be here tonight, Carol. Thank you. Um, Having lived part of my life as a Catholic, mm -hmm. and then part of my life as an atheist, okay. and then part of my life as a Protestant, okay. I would say that Pascal sounds less like a Catholic and more like a Protestant. And that's probably partly because you have a Protestant giving you the life and thought of Pascal. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, there's a whole other talk I could give on ways I disagree with Pascal. <laughs> Which would be really fun, actually. Save that idea. Um, well, rarely have I heard a Catholic talk about the God of Abraham, Abraham Isaac, Isaac, Jacob. Mm -hmm. And in that same text, which again he wrote kind of for himself, and, and and they think that he recopied it regularly. It seems like it was rewritten so that it could stay with him whenever it kind of deteriorated. Um, at the very end of it, uh, it says total, total submission to God and my spiritual director, which is something that you know, I think Protestants are starting to get a little bit more into spiritual direction than they've been. But that idea of total submission I think still doesn't sit terribly well with Protestant sensibilities. I think his, his spirituality, like his own sense of what it meant to follow and worship God, I think was deeply Catholic. Um, there's never any indication that he considered going over to the Protestant side or anything like that. Um, but the kind of Catholicism that he fell in with, the Jansenists, it's, um, 
is very Augustinian. Again, it's it's um, probably some of the most Protestant Catholicism that he could have encountered in his day. Uh, but you're also getting it from me, and I'm 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 chopping out all the bits that I don't understand and that don't interest me. <laughs> so um, go and go and read go and read the full text of the memorial. Um, read the full text of the Pensees. There's there's some things in there that. Uh, he, he believed, this isn't necessarily a Protestant Catholic thing, I'm just kind of rambling at this point, but he believed fervently in the ongoing reality of miracles. There was a particular um, healing event with, I think, his niece involving a, a thorn. It was the miracle of the thorn, and, and she was reportedly healed of a problem with her eye, and it like totally convinced Pascal. He was totally sold that this happened, and that miracles continued to happen, and that they were good evidence for the truth of Christianity. Now, conclude whatever you want about that, but that doesn't often fall into philosophical discussions of Pascal and some of his apologetic work. It's very Pascaline, um, and I would have to do a little bit of digging to see if it's apocryphal or not. It it kind of feels almost too too apropos because he also contributed to these vacuum experiments. But maybe that meant that he was thinking about the vacuum. I I don't recall. I apologize. Um, that I, I could do some digging and find out if that's correctly attributed or not. Along with that, could you could you explain a little more about the vacuum? I, I didn't quite pick up. I can try. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason I went quickly through the math and science bits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there was a there was a big debate in the kind of scientific world at that time about whether a vacuum could actually exist in nature. Um, so you've heard the phrase, nature abhors a vacuum. This kind of fit with the medieval cosmology that, that said that every part of the world needed to be full of something. Um, so there, there was a you know, theological and philosophical reason to think a vacuum shouldn't exist. And then there were some people that started to say, well, but what if we checked? What if we actually did some experiments to see? And then you have to figure out what kind of experiments are you going to do to actually test that. And I'm not the right person to try to explain what those experiments were or why they were effective. But you've got kind of two pieces of it. You've got, does a vacuum exist or not? But at another level, you've got, how are we going to answer that question? Are we going to answer that question based on sitting in our plush armchairs and reasoning and thinking through whether or not a vacuum fits with our sense of how God made the universe? Or are we going to test it by getting some glass and some mercury and a very tall ladder? And I don't remember all the bits of it. You know, this is before the kind of science labs that we have today. This helped <laughs> contribute to the kind of science labs that we have today. Um, but you have to figure out how you're going to do that. And you have to believe that that's the right way to answer that question. And so he contributes to both of those. That was very helpful. Are you going to tell me how, all the ways I got that wrong? No, no, no. I, I just thought I would mention that his name, Pascal's name, is attached to the official international unit for pressure. Yeah. The square area is the Pascal. Yeah. And, and so the existence of the vacuum is part of physics. It's part of thinking about how matter moves and interacts and, and, you know, it had something to do with, like, if there was a vacuum, the, the, I think mercury in the glass would, you know, be raised this much instead of that much, or it would be raised under these conditions, or it's all, it's all under physics. Okay, yeah. Air pressure. So, uh, Goodreads says, there's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing but only by God the Creator made known through Jesus Christ, Blaise Pascal. Some translations say a God-shaped hole instead of vacuum, which might be why you were hesitant. Well, I think that would be an artifact of 17th century French not having quite as technical distinctions. Right. So I, th I think the, I believe the French word would be vide, 
which would be kind of where we would get void today. And so it would refer to the technical existence of a vacuum, but it would also refer to this kind of just sense of emptiness. Thank you, both. Thank you. I don't know if Bill Wilson, the, uh, <clears throat> the author of Alcoholics Anonymous, ever read Pascal, but his approach to pain and suffering and the disease of alcoholism um, is very similar, where uh, people who follow 12-step programs actually are thankful for their illness which led them into a spiritual dimension that they never would have achieved otherwise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you for that. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Um, there's people here who have been walking with the Lord so much longer than I have. And, you know, we thank him for times of joy and blessing and wholeness, but... I think most of us know that we meet him more profoundly and more deeply in times of struggle and suffering of one kind or another. And it deeply frustrates me that the world we live in today is not willing to sit with those things, to, is not willing to be driven to a sense of spiritual hunger and need, but wants to medicate or distract its way out of it. That is so concerning to me. Hey, one last question. Um, well, if I could just ask one briefly. I, it, it seems to me that with my personal introduction to Pascal was through a class in apologetics. Yes. Well, is, is, is there any, any ideas behind why it seems to be among evangelical Protestants Pascal is primarily identified as an apologist? Oh, that's a very interesting question. And that was my own first introduction to him as well. I knew that he had engaged in mathematical and scientific works that were significant, but I, I think I maybe knew what Pascal's triangle was. They weren't mm -hmm. part of my mm -hmm. real introduction to him. I knew nothing of his struggle with pain until I started learning more about his biography. Uh, and I, I knew very little of his Catholicism, too, until I started reading yeah. biographies of him. Did you have something you wanted to throw in? Or were you just playing with the pen? Oh, okay. Um, I think any causal answer I give is going to be ill-formed and speculative, but it's a question I'll continue to ponder. Yeah, that's great. I can add a little bit to that, yeah. just because this is the book I'm reading right now, Reasons of the Heart, Recovering Christian Persuasion. It's a little bit, so I, I teach imaginative apologetics. Todd teaches um, more traditional apologetics. And this particular book argues that Pascal kind of stands in between the two. Yeah. That he's got a foot in both worlds. Mm -hmm. so. That makes a lot of sense. Some of it is that some of his other stuff is quite obscure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that doesn't mean it's not part. worthwhile, but... Uh, so the Provincial lever Letters is his engagement with the Jansenist Jesuit controversy, and I, I skipped it because I don't understand any of it. <laughs> um, most of his mathematical and scientific work, you know, is interesting for history of science purposes, like how we got to where we are today, but it's not how you would actually learn any of that today. Well, uh, thank you again. Uh, thank you. Thank you.